QM. QM. Okay, here we go. All right. Let's see. Uh, turn lights on board. Ooh. Actually, turn the lights on the board and not turning the lights off. Okay, so we were separating variables. And so just kind of picking up where we left off, we had <coughs> started with the um, Schrodinger equation for two particles in one dimension. And they were both the same mass. And then we broke it down like one always does separating variables into uh, terms that only depend on one variable. So namely these two terms. That only depends on x1 plus this other thing that only depends on x2 have to add up to be a constant. And then we make the same kind of argument we've made in the past, which is okay, here's the x1, x2 plane. Let me move along a line of say constant x2. So only x1. So then this will say along this line, got function of x1 plus, well wait a minute, if only x1 is changing, we're holding x2 fixed here. This is a constant also, plus constant equals E, which again is constant. Therefore, that function of x1 is actually a constant itself, too. the same thing about the function of x2 alone. blah, 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 the function of x2 is constant. That's always the kind of argument we make here, that, okay, all those separate terms are constants. Why, what should we call this? call it E1 because it's going to represent the energy of particle 1. And let's call the other one Fred. 
or maybe E2 instead, because it's going to be the energy of particle 2, although I kind of like Fred. So, all this is equal to E1. All this is equal to E2. So therefore, we have that minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi 1 dx1 squared plus d of x1 psi 1 of x1 is equal to e1 times psi 1 of x1. Well, that's ties for particle 1 by itself. interacting with each other. And similarly, same thing for particle 2. Ties for particle 2 by itself. Remember, though, that this is predicated on the not interacting with each other, that they're only interacting with an external potential, so that there's no cross terms in d of x1 and x2. It's just d of x1, d1 of x1 plus d2 of x2. So this says the energy eigenstates. And so voila, this is useful. Can I erase this part? Yes. Oh, you still have? Okay. Away it goes. And so everything is simple and beautiful, except recall we've been assuming the particles are distinguishable from one another. You can tell which one is which.
But the world is full of things like electrons and protons and so forth. And in quantum mechanics, when you have particles that are identical, they are as identical as identical could be. As in the author of your book has a quote where he says, all electrons are utterly identical in a way that no two classical objects can ever be. It's not just that we don't happen to know which electron is which, God doesn't know which is which because there's no such thing as this electron or that electron. All we can legitimately speak about is an electron. You simply can't tell. Well, one way to understand that is to think in terms of, um, for example, if I have a pair of billiard balls, let's say. I make, in my notes, I talk about Yahtzee, but here I'm going to make it billiards. So I've got <coughs> two identical billiard balls, or billiard cue balls, let's say. And of course, you can't make two cue balls truly identical to one another because their surfaces won't be exactly right on, alike on the atomic scale. But even if you imagine that you could, you could make them as truly identical as you can imagine. Classically speaking, we can still tell which one is which because if you think about it, as long as you're watching, they follow according to classical physics. Now, classical physics is a figment of our imaginations, but according to classical physics, they follow well-defined trajectories so that you could, in principle, follow them around separately from one another and know which is which. But quantum particles, does a quantum particle follow a well-defined trajectory where you can know where it is and how it's moving at all times? Can you do that in quantum? No, you cannot. Can't do that, yeah. So in other words, in quantum mechanics, you simply don't have this ability to follow identical particles around and know which one is which because you could see what their histories were. They simply don't have that property in quantum mechanics. And as a result, quantum identical particles truly are identical. So, QM identical particles truly are indistinguishable. Sure we can. There's the one on the left and there's the other one on the right. But think of it again as if we measure their positions again, they don't follow definite trajectories. And so you cannot say which one ended up in the new positions.
so we can't trace them back to where they were before individually. And so we have to find a way of encapsulating this when we write down the wave function. We have to write it in such a way that you can't say which particle is which. That they're treated indistinguishably from one another within the wave function. What questions so far? So let's just show how it's done. System of two identical particles, I'll just read it first and write it. If we perform a measurement on a system of two identical particles and find that one is in state psi sub a, as opposed to like measuring position, we find one's in state psi sub a, the other is in state psi sub b, which could be there are two particular locations, but it might be just this one's in energy state a, this one's in energy state b, whatever. The wave function must be indifferent as to which particle is in which state. And so we have to write it, as we'll see, as either a symmetric or an anti-symmetric combination of products of the two wave functions. What? Well, I'll just write it down. This means that if we perform a measurement on a system of two identical particles, state psi A and the other is in state psi B, the other is in state psi B, we find out like the wave functions of the two particles or whatever. <coughs> psi plus minus, so in other words, this is two possible choices, one is psi plus, the other is psi minus, of R1 and R2, so I'm letting R1 and R2 be their three-dimensional position vectors, so if I wrote it all out, it would be psi of x1 comma, y1 comma, z1 comma, x2 comma, y2 comma, z2 comma, all six coordinates of the two particles is some normalization constant times, and here's what we do, we say it's a combination, a superposition of psi A of R1, psi B of R2, so if the two particles were distinguishable, we would stop here. This would be the first particles in state psi A, the second particles in state psi B, but that's not allowed if they're indistinguishable. You can't say which one is in which state. So we say plus or minus psi B of R1, 
sine a of r2. So in other words, there are two terms, <coughs> one of which has psi, one of which has particle one in state psi a and particle two in state psi b, and the other of which flips that around. It's particle one that's in state psi b and particle two that's in state psi a. It's a superposition, equal parts of both. And A here is a normalization constant. if we flip the particle labels, or another way to put it would be change R1 to R2, change R2 to R1. So, know that psi plus minus of R2 comma R1 is equal to plus minus A times psi plus minus of In other words, with the plus sign in between them, if I change R1 to R2 and R2 to R1 in both terms, it doesn't change anything because A plus B is the same thing as B plus A. With the minus sign, if I change it, it flips the sign because A minus B is minus B minus A. So that's the idea here, that interchanging R1 and R2, kind of flipping which particles which, either keeps the sign the same or multiplies by minus one. But all we really care about <coughs> on some level is what are the probabilities? And that doesn't change the probability. Multiplying a thing by minus one doesn't change its absolute square when we tell you probabilities. Okay, I think that in essence answers my question. I was gonna say, yeah. if they're indistinguishable, why would flipping? Right, it's because, it's because really what we can measure are probability density. And so this, that's not changed by changing the sign of the wave function. You're always free to multiply the wave function by an arbitrary complex phase, including e to the i pi equals minus one, and it doesn't change anything about the probability density. So it's okay, is what it, is what it comes down to. So the rest of the sentence is, so that psi plus minus of R2, R1 squared, its absolute square, is equal to the absolute square of psi plus minus R1, R2. If you interchange the two particles, the probability density is unchanged.
we say that psi plus is the symmetric combination, and psi minus is the anti-symmetric combination. I'm just going to quote the result of the spin, spin statistics theorem of relativistic quantum mechanics. You can prove this in relativistic quantum mechanics. In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, like we're doing, it's just an add-on. We just take it for granted. But in relativistic quantum mechanics, you can prove that for the wave function to transform properly under Lorentz transformations, what I'm about to say has to be the case. According to the spin statistics theorem, relativistic quantum mechanics in all of physics is this right here. Because without it, we wouldn't have atoms that didn't have all the electrons just drop into the ground state. There'd be no chemistry, there'd be no us. So thank you, universe, for thinking that relativity should rule. Because this ultimately comes from that. Because if both particles are in the same state, the anti-symmetric wave function goes bye-bye. Symmetric, but I'm not aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Right. 
ambisymmetric, ah, uh, say the inverse of the ambisymmetric wave function, that vanishes. <laughs> Because psi minus of R1 and 2 would be A times psi A of R1, psi A of R2 minus psi A of R2, psi A of R1. That's zero because the two terms are the same. This gives us the famous Pauli exclusion principle. Yeah, Pauli exclusion principle. Two identical fermions cannot occupy the same state. So you couldn't have two electrons in, say, a 2s orbital that both have the same spin state. They have to be in opposite spin states, namely the singlet, because the singlet is the anti-symmetric combination of two spin states. <coughs> so this is why, for any orbital in an atom, they can only have two electrons, and they have to be in the singlet state because they have to have opposite spin. They have to have the anti-symmetric combination of spin, which is a more sophisticated understanding, right? The high school understanding is, oh, they have opposite spins, but it's more than that. The, the, their spin state is, as we'll see in a minute, one over root two, first one spin up, second one spin down, minus second one spin down, uh, first one, second one spin down, up second one spin down, so there's equal parts of both being spin up and both being spin down. So now we'll figure out what A is. What questions do you have? Okay, what's A? So what is A such that the wave function is normalized? assume psi A and psi B are of the norm. space 
that two particles in three dimensions have. They say, okay, if the wave function is normalized, I add up the probabilities for every point in space, probability of density times a little volume element in the six dimensional space, add it all up and I should get that being equal to one. Then here's what we get. So this will be absolute square of A. And then we got to find the absolute square of psi plus psi minus. So we have to FOIL. Okay. So this becomes A square integral of, and this is one of the things that looks more terrible than it is, psi A of R1, psi B of R2, plus minus psi B of R1, psi A of R2. So what I did to flip the two terms, right? You can either flip R1 and R2, or you can flip A and B, flip the labels. So I'm flipping the labels here. Star, right, because it's gonna be absolute square, so you take this star times this. So you get psi A of R1, psi B of R2, plus minus, psi B of R1, psi A of R2, of that, D3 R1, D3 R2. And so you know, you, when you do the FOIL, you're gonna get four terms out, right? In other words, you'll get Psi A star, Psi B star, Psi A, Psi B for R1 and R2, all of these will be four terms. And I'm going to use the fact that if I have f of x g of y dx dy, a double integral like that, that you get the factor, that this is equal to the product of the integral of f of x dx times the integral of g of y dy. And we're going to have that thing here because I got d3 r1, d3 r2, and things like psi a's and psi b's of only r1, only r2. So, the next line would be, this is equal to absolute square of A, and then big curly brace. So um, I will do integral of psi A of R1 absolute square, D3 R1 times psi b of r2 absolute square d3 r2 and this is coming from this pair of terms because we're going to get psi a of r psi a star of r1 psi a of r1 psi b star of r2 psi b of r2 so those will be the absolute squares of psi a of r1 and psi b of r2 so that's the first set. And then we're going to get plus minus, depending on whether it's the plus or the minus, and then we'll have the integral of psi a star of r1, psi b of r1, d3 r1, times the integral of psi b of r, <coughs> psi b star of r2, psi a of r2, d3 r2, plus minus, another kind of cross term, 
because you can never get tired of writing these things out. Psi B star of R1, Psi A of R1, D3 R1 times Psi A star of R2, Psi B of R2, D3 R2, And then finally, plus, because whether it's plus, <coughs> when I do the, when I multiply these last two terms together, it's either plus this one, plus that one, plus this one times plus this one, or minus this one times minus that one. So it's going to be a plus in either case. So plus absolute square of psi b of r1. R1 times the integral of the absolute square of psi A of R2 D3 R2 close curly braces We rewrite it in pink chalk. <laughs> no, we don't. So now I'll give you all red pen so you can rewrite it all for no reason whatsoever other than to. So we're assuming that psi A and psi B are orthonormal. They're both normalized and they're orthogonal to one another. So what's this integral equal to? It's one because, remember the, the variable, the name of the variable of an integration doesn't matter. So if I integrate psi A squared over all of space, that's one because it's normalized. What happens if I integrate psi b squared over all of space? It's normalized, so that's equal to 1. Okay, over here. Psi b squared of r1, d3 r1, is the same thing as do it with respect to r2, because the name of the variable in integration doesn't matter. It's a dummy variable, mathematically speaking. So that's 1. And that's 1. And they're orthonormal. So if I take the inner product of psi b and psi a, what's that equal to? Zero, they're orthonormal, so zero, 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 zero. So in other words, we get a squared times one times one plus zero times zero plus zero times zero plus one times one. Of all of that. All of this to say has a squared. So this is 2a squared. One equals 2a squared. So after all that, a is one over the square root of two. is one over this 
square the two. And again, you could always say e to the i phi if you wanted to, but we don't. There's no reason to. So e to the i phi when you complex conjugate it would be e to the minus i phi. So <coughs> normalizations are always only defined up to multiplying by e to the i p for whatever p you like, as long as it's real. So a is one over root two. But wait, we have double counted. We have double counted. However, now we're going to stick with this as being the normalization, but it's going to, we're going to have to do something else to make up for that effect. However, note that in the integration, double counted. For every point, R1 is say some vector u, R2 is some vector v, So tempted to make it equal to d2, right? In any case, there is a point r1 equals v, r2 equals u. And we've included them both in this integration. We integrated over all space. But those two situations are indistinguishable. We can't say the first particle is at u, the second particle is at v, versus the first particle is at z, the second particle is at u. They're, they're just indistinguishable. So, and we've included them both in the integration. physically distinct due to the indistinguishability of the two particles. thing before oh this is, yeah yeah last thing before break we just saw the words since we are including both points when we normalize Or finding one particle at u and the other at v. 
four four. About to give, I was about to give you another chance to, but I, I failed to do so this time. Four. One particle at U and the other at V. So that'll be the sum of those two contributions. Psi plus minus four. R1 is U, R2 is V. Absolute squared. Plus psi plus minus R1 is V. R2 is U. Uh, absolute squared. Which will be Two times psi plus minus at R one equals U, R one is U, comma R two equals V, absolute square. So in other words, what it comes down to is we don't bother doing this because these two densities are the same. You just say I don't care which one is which. God doesn't know either. So if I want to know what's the probability of finding one of them at three and the other one at two, you just evaluate the wave function at three comma two, take its absolute square, and then multiply by two to get the probability density. Because there's another term that would contribute that would give exactly the same thing. So all we care about finding, because that's all we can do, is all we care about is What's the chances that one particle will be found at U and the other particle will be found at V? And distinguishability says that's all we can know. We can't say there's no such thing as what's the chances of finding the first electron at U and the second electron at V? You can just say and elect one of the electrons at U and the other electron at V, but we don't know which is which. Yes? So, um, for the Okay, yeah. For the actual wave function, yep. is A still the same? Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to stick with A being 1 over the root 2 for the normalization with the understanding that then to find probability densities, we multiply these, we multiply by 2 there. We, we just pick one of the points uh, that has U and V and we ignore the other one and just multiply by 2. So that's, that's just understood. We could also not do that, and that would change the normalization, but it's, it's just considered more convenient to keep the normalization, and remember we have to do that. Another way to think of it is, okay, I can't draw this in six dimensions, but I can draw it in two particles in one dimension, it's all you can draw, right? So uh, here's, <coughs> here's x1, here's x2, because two particles in two dimensions, well I need x1, x2, uh, or, I mean, yeah, x1, x2, y1, oh wait, where's y2? I have to draw it perpendicular to all three of those. I need a four-dimensional thing. Crap. Just you know, do it. So, so what's that? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. So, and then I, and then I, and then I move my arm and it disappears because it went out of, out of our It goes in that direction. <laughs> yeah. It went in that direction perpendicular to the universe. If I could do that, I'd be, you know, it's obviously yeah. uh, be pretty, pretty cool, yes. Yeah. So here is, I could do like, okay, here's this point right here in the x1, x2 plane, u, uh, what I would say, u, and uh, my, my, my thing I drew here is wrong. So let's say this. <laughs> <coughs> Let's say that this is u, that's v. So this would be the point x1 equals u, x2 equals v. And then here is the diagonal line, x1 equals x2. 
And symmetric on the other side of that is the equivalent point over here, if I do, if I do it accurately, where here is B, here is U, this is X1 equals B, X2 equals U. Those are the two points that we're talking about. They're symmetric around the dividing line, or in six dimensions, you know, the dividing, whatever the hell that would be, right? Um, so it'd be the divide, let's see, so I guess it's probably half the dimension, be like the dividing three plane that divides six dimensional space into two halves, right? Why, I can vision, no, I can't visualize that. But anyway, that's the idea. So we're adding up those two probabilities. <coughs> so in practice, all you care about is one's U, the other's B. So in some sense, we stay on one side of that line because that contains all the stuff that we can know. And then we multiply everything by two when we find the absolute squares. Great time.
funniest person I know? That one's pretty funny.
I, th I think we're ready to start. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's do this. The last push. That's weird. Of course, it's supposed to be yesterday. Bonus time. Oh, not bonus time. Makeup time here in cosmetology. <laughs> Earlier today, I said, now I have to go to a QM makeup class, which is where we learn the quantum mechanics of makeup. Makeup, that's right, yes. So you're like... <laughs> or how to do our, I, no, I said how to do our makeup quantum mechanically. Exactly, right. So, which is just doing so, your makeup regularly. Yeah, well, no, it can be weird because you might look in the mirror and it's like, oh, wait a minute, my my eyeshadow's on my lips and my lipstick's on my eyelids, right? You know, because it's... You like, can't know where the makeup is. You can't know which makeup places. is where, that's right, yes. Uh-huh, exactly. Because that is how it works, yes. Yes. Okay. Exchange forces. They don't put it in quotes, but it really should be in quotes. It's not a force. But it kind of acts like one in a way, sort of. And physicists can be sloppy like other people with how they use language. So, uh, consider two identical particles in one dimension and given with states given by psi A and psi B. In other words, let's keep doing what we're doing. So since I can never be distracted, that reminds me. One thing I don't like about Google uh, Maps is when you're, <laughs> you know, because when you're driving on a road, uh, if there's a roundabout, or what were the other terms we used? Let's see. Oh, rotary. Rotary, rotary right. Yeah, yeah, if you're coming up on a rotary. Traffic circle. Traffic circle, yes. A circular junction. Circular junction. A circle. What, what Google Eva, as I like to call her, will say is, uh, in, in half a mile, at the, I think she says, at the traffic circle, take the second exit to stay on Cell Mill Parkway. I'm like, allow me to translate. In half a mile, don't do anything. <laughs> and I drive home on Cell Mill Parkway, which has like five, six traffic circles on it. And if I happen to have her talking to me, like if I'm navigating from over and over again, she says not to do anything. Over to, okay. I feel better now that I've gotten that off my chest. So anyway, consider two identical particles in one dimension. Just to keep it simple, we'll be in one dimension. But you can easily see the same principle applies in more. In states given by psi A and psi B. Yeah, that's how that came to mind, because on, on one level, what I'm saying is, now let's keep considering what we've been considering, right, what before. In states given by psi A and psi B. I mean, I guess on some level we were doing B three R's over there, so maybe I shouldn't be so whatever. Anyway, we have for the probability distribution in space, So that'll be two times the absolute square of one over root two times psi a of x one, psi b of x two, plus minus psi b of x two, psi a, uh, no, psi b of x one, psi a of x two, and there are some books that flip the x1, x2, and others that flip the a and the b. So we're flipping the a and the b here. All that squared. <coughs> so, oh look, 2 times 1 over the root 2 squared is 1. So, none of that. So we just have to foil the stuff inside the square brackets there. And so this becomes, I feel like I'm practicing foiling all the time here. Psi so a of x1 absolute square 
psi d of x2 absolute square plus <coughs> go to the last terms this time psi d of x1 absolute square times psi uh, a of x2 absolute square and then it's plus minus time plus minus psi a star of x1 psi b of x1 <coughs> times psi b star of x2 psi a of x2 I would never make any mistakes. Why, if I made mistakes, I know that GK would say something. GK never speaks up about me making mistakes. In the alternate universe that the, you know, they're like, they're like, what are you talking about? Coming through my throat. <laughs> Yes, we've jumped to that other universe where you don't make any mistakes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if we have two distinguishable particles, represents the probability for finding particle 1 at, uh, at x1 and particle 2 at x2. Because in that case, we could have a wave function, which was just psi a of x1, psi b of x2, and we wouldn't have to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize it if the particles are distinguishable. You're allowed to know <laughs> which particle <coughs> is in which state in that case. And the first term represents the probability density for finding particle 1 at x1 and particle 2 at x2.
similarly, the second term represents the same, except then we've got particle one in state psi b and particle two in state psi a. Similarly, the second term represents the same, particles in which state, that term by itself would be if particle 1 were in state psi b and particle 2 were in state psi a, this is the probability of finding particle 1 at x1, and this is the probability density of particle 2 at x2, so your product is the probability of finding particle 1 at x1 and particle 2 at x2, this part of probability multiply when you say and. What questions do you have? So now let's look what happens as x1 and x2 both approach the same value. Now look at the case x1 approaches x2, they both go to some value x. P minus of x comma x, the probability of finding both particles at the same location that's 2 times the absolute square of psi minus of x comma x squared and that's 0 because if you plug in x for x1 and x2, put in that minus sign there, it goes away. Right? If, the <coughs> if the arguments of both psi a and psi b are the same number, then the anti-symmetric wave function at those points goes away. The anti-symmetric wave function vanishes for all points where both particles are, for all situations where both particles are at the same location. In other words, along that in, in one dimension, it would be along that diagonal line that I showed you before, right? Here's x1, here's x2, here's the line where x1 is equal to x2. So anywhere along that line in the two-dimensional space, the two particles, probability, joint probability density is zero. The wave function vanishes along that line. So in other words, the particles are not allowed to be at the same place. The probability density for finding them on top of one another is zero. And if we look at P plus of xx, well that's 2 psi plus square. Well, that'll be 2 times absolute square of 1 over root 2 psi a of x psi b of x plus psi b of x psi a of x. root 
two squares to one half here, and then psi a of x, psi b of x plus psi b of x, psi a of x is two psi a of x, psi b of x. So you get four times psi a of x, psi b of x, absolute square. is four times larger than the case of two distinguishable particles in definite states. So in other words, if the part, if the wave function, if the spatial wave function is anti-symmetric, the two particles tend to avoid one another. There's low probability density for the particles being close to one another. It's zero for on top of one another. And in general, if x1 and x2 are nearly equal, the probability density is low. And it's the opposite for symmetric wave functions. spatial wave function Be sure to read the textbook leading up to it. Where it is shown. So, more sophisticated would be for saying clump versus anti-clump or whatever, 
finding the expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. The expectation value of the square of the distance between the two particles. is generally larger for a symmetric Anti-symmetric wave function, the one of these for, uh, away from each other, for an anti-symmetric wave function. They tend to clump together. The wave, the, the probability density is higher than it would be if you didn't symmetrize the wave function. And the opposite of that for anti-symmetric. So the idea would be again where we can actually draw it. You can imagine. We can make a plot of psi squared as a, as a surface above the x1, x2 plane, or you could shade it in where like um, uh, brighter shading is higher probability density, darker shading is lower probability density, something like that. <coughs> and what you find is that in the symmetric case, this line tends to be bright. There's extra, extra probability there. And in the anti-symmetric case, this is like a void there. It's low probability, it'd be dark there. And so we call them exchange forces because it's kind of like, for the anti-symmetric case, it's pushing the particles away from one another. And for the symmetric case, it's drawing them together. But there aren't any actual forces involved. There's no forces that the particles are exerting on one another. It's really best thought of as a geometrical effect that comes out of having to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize the wave function. So it's a purely quantum mechanical effect that again just, just doesn't show up in classical physics. It's purely quantum mechanical. But it's also super important. So let's look at an example of an application of this idea of exchange forces namely the covalent bond. Application, the, co the covalent bond. Now it's, it's in the it's more complicated than what I'm going to make it here, but qualitatively, this is the idea. So,
actually say which electron belongs to which atom? No, because the electrons are indistinguishable. indistinguishable. You can't say which one is attached to which atom. You can just say there's two electrons bound to a nuclei, but you can't say which one is which. So really, the wave, there's not the wave function of this electron and the wave function of that electron. You have to write a symmetric or an anti-symmetric combination. Yes? You said indistinguishable, right? That's what I hope I said. OK. Yes, and if I didn't, then no, I goofed no. again. I, I, <laughs> right. I just We're wasn't just, sure. No, 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 yeah, no. I very much appreciate when, it's, especially this, this is evening, it's the last class, I'm getting kind of like blah, 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 blah at this point. So yeah. If, yes? If the so, H atoms have the same So say, say this again. If the H atoms, if yeah. they each also had the same energy, like it's all indistinguishable. So, so there's right. So strictly speaking, if you wanted to write down the wave function of all the electrons in the universe, you'd need to anti-symmetrize the whole thing. So um, as an aside, here's a fun little fact. So, but this is not that. This is not that. This is actually more okay. So how can I <coughs> construct an anti-symmetric wave function? I can use a determinant. In other words, uh, if I take the determinant, let's say it's psi b of x1, psi k of, of x2. What's the determinant of that matrix? Yeah, psi a of x1. Uh, whoops, let's see. Kidding. Uh, this is, you know, I'm going in a side, so I'm forgetting to. Psi b, psi a of x1, psi a of x1, psi b of x2, and I want this to be minus psi a of x2. Psi B of X1. I find the determinant of this matrix right here, right? Psi A of X1, Psi B of X2 minus Psi A of X2, Psi B of X1. So that's how you would anti-symmetrize if I have two particles. If I've got three particles and I want to write the anti-symmetric wave function, you just make a three by three determinant. If you have four particles, you just make a four by four de de determinant similar to this pattern like that. So, Let's see, I'm forgetting the numbers, but it's like, it's something like, I think it's actually like the, the number of terms in a determinant is like, yeah, I think it's the, is that right? The factorial of the number of rows and columns, something like, let's see. So, well, is that, is that right? Let's see. So if I have a three by three matrix, yeah, there's like six terms. Um, yeah, so, so the, cause, because if, if I have like um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, right? It's going to be A times E, I minus F, H minus B times two terms plus C times two terms. So one, two, three, four, five, six terms, which is three factorial. It works out the number of terms is the factorial of, in the determinant, is the factorial of the dimension of the matrix. So, if you have a free electron atom like lithium and you anti-symmetrize the wave function, it's got six terms with various pluses and minuses. If you have a 69 electron atom, 69 factorial is like larger than the number of part subatomic particles in the universe. So even for a single multi-electron atom, if you were to write down its fully anti-symmetric wave function, the number of terms, you, you, there, there are plenty of atoms in the periodic table where the number of terms in the fully anti-symmetric wave function is larger than the number of subatomic particles in the universe, which means there's no way you could write it down. There's just not enough stuff in the universe to write it down, right? You can't write more, you know, at best you could do one term per subatomic particle and you can't even do that. So I don't know what the answer to this, but what are the philosophical implications of the fact that even a single atom 
has a wave function that couldn't literally be written down because there's just not enough stuff in the universe to do it. Does that mean the wave function is not actually real? I don't know, but it's just crazy. Now, on some level, it follows a pattern, and so it doesn't matter that you can't write it all down, but if the wave function is real, on some level, doesn't it really have all those terms, and it doesn't it live in there? That blah, 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 blah. Okay, so anyway, stuff to think about. So bring two h atoms in the ground state, and the one s orbital. So the composite wave function. the two electrons is the anti-symmetric combination of single particle states. Really say which one belongs to which one. So if their spatial wave function is symmetric, the two electrons tend to be close to each other, so to speak. There's a higher probability of finding them near one another. There's extra probability of finding them near one another. So if you were to kind of make a probability density map, you get something like, here's a proton, here's a proton, and there is a region of electron cloud, if you will, of uh, relatively high probability in between the two protons. Electrons have a relatively high probability of being in between the two protons. Attracting the protons inwards and, and produce uh, inwards and producing a covalent bond. what we call, and again, there's more details than this, but this is the bonding orbital. So, to a first approximation, you would say, okay, well, what if the electrons didn't interact with one another? Then the total wave function is really just a product of the two single particle wave functions, but it has to be, uh, but if you make it symmetric, then that product has extra probability between the two protons. Now, it's more complicated than that because the electrons do interact with one another, and so that changes the shape of the wave function and puts a term in the energy due to the repulsion of the electrons. So it's more complicated than this, but to lowest order, if the two electrons 
are spatially speaking forming a symmetric spatial wave function that helps bind the atom together, the two atoms together into a covalently bonded hydrogen molecule. If their spatial wave function is anti-symmetric, Two protons are repelling one another without any screening. represents the two uh, represents a lower energy than if the two hydrogens were far apart from one another. The antibonding orbital represents a higher energy. And in fact, what happens is if you imagine holding the protons at a fixed distance from one another and just solve the Schrodinger equation, how do the electrons behave? And you make a plot of energy versus distance between them you find you get something like this for the bonding orbital and something like this for the anti-bonding. So in other words, there's an optimal separation between them that minimizes their energy and that sets how far apart the protons are in a hydrogen molecule. There's an optimal distance where the overall energy of the system is at its lowest because if you keep making them closer and closer, then the electrons really, the protons really start to feel one another. The electrons are really feeling one another, so to speak. So again, no time to go into all that here, but just to see that there's this real physical effect from these so-called exchange forces. And so the last thing before you go take physical chemistry, I mean, I'm not expecting you to, but. I've never had either. I'd like to sometime. Maybe when I retire, I'll read a physical chemistry book. But in any case, question: Electrons are they bosons or fermions? They are fermions because they are spin one half particles. Electrons are fermions. So how can the spatial wave function be symmetric? I thought that for fermions, the, space, the, the wave function had to be anti-symmetric. Electrons are fermions, and we've, we've already given away the answer before. So how can the spatial wave function be symmetric? So include is the wave function of electron only including space? It also includes. It also includes. It includes spin. Yeah, it includes. Oh, now I'm dizzy. It includes spin. It includes spin. Answer. Is the product or a sum of products? 
it could be a superposition. Or a sum of products of a space part and a spin part. Space part is anti symmetric and vice versa because the whole thing has to be anti symmetric. <coughs> and so, if they were both anti symmetric, they'd both change sign when you flip the particles, which would, which would not flip the overall sign of the wave function. So, one has to be symmetric, the other has to be anti symmetric. If the spin part is symmetric, Space part is anti symmetric and vice versa. So the two electrons in the covalent bond. must be in the singlet state. So the singlet state is the one that has the anti-symmetric combination of plus minus and minus plus. It's that one right there. That's the singlet state. So we know S equals zero, M equals zero. There's no net spin angular momentum of the two electrons in the covalent bond. Should like like uh, since there's a very e end and it has to be like dramatic here like. <laughs>